Right, hope so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right, the coming season, uh, are you prepared? Which isn't quite what Richard said, because I don't know where, where they got the other bit from. Um, anyway, this, um, uh, this is a presentation I've had for, I should think, approaching 15 years now. So some of you may have heard it. Uh, now, normally what I do is I give it to um, or present it to uh, local associations. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, with the local associations, you can get um, people there who aren't even beekeepers yet. And others have been keeping bees 60 years, which is, uh, uh, which is quite common. Um, so as this is really for the intermediate and advanced uh, stage, uh, what I've done is I've, um, I've tweaked it a bit during the day and um, but it is still suitable, I think, for those who've only just kept bees a short time. So um, I hope everything is uh, okay with it. So um, the usual uh, commercial, the beekeeping book practical guide that I've had out now for several years. Um, there's still quite a lot of beekeepers, even um, what one might term advanced ones, who simply don't know of Dave Cushman's website. Um, Dave. Uh, was a very good uh, beekeeper, died 10 years ago now, and he left the website to me in his will. And it's reckoned to be uh, the world's most comprehensive beekeeping website. Um, there's a lot of good information on there, and it's all good sound stuff too, not some of the, um, uh, the sort of stuff that you tend to get on the internet. <clears throat> So what do we actually mean by season and what, what, how I've set this one up is that I want to try and get people sort of thinking a little bit more about what they're doing rather than just what they did last year or the year before uh, or whatever. Uh, what do we as beekeepers actually mean by the season? Is it the active season? Is it from supers on until supers off? Is it from first inspection to the last? Uh, is it just a swarming season? And I guess beekeepers probably have a different view of it but we as beekeepers have got to realize that beekeeping is actually a cycle there's no fixed times about it at all as far as the uh, the colony of bees is concerned they're just ongoing and ongoing and ongoing and those that live six eight ten weeks during the summer um their their real purpose is to try and make sure that the uh, colony is still there uh, come next spring, come the following uh, spring, all the way through. So it, it's it's that sort of arrangement with uh, with bees. But whatever we mean, <coughs> seasons actually vary. Um, each year is different, as we uh, know. Um, just ask a gardener. Um, there's also climate and um, timing um, uh, uh, changes as well, because we all know that even in our own area, some springs can be four weeks out um, from what the last one was or what the next one will be. There's also district variation too, because if you're in uh, Cornwall, um, your conditions are certainly not going to be the same as uh, perhaps further up country in the, in the Lake District. So as far as beekeeping is concerned, one size doesn't fit all. So a presentation like this or a a book or an article in a, in a magazine or whatever, um, you've got to tweak it to suit your own situation. And that's something that I don't think beekeepers or beekeeping teachers uh, do, do enough of. <coughs> so preparation then, you actually need um, quite a bit of knowledge uh, and experience. Um, but if you haven't got it, that's okay, that's fine. Just ask for a bit of local help and advice and they'll perhaps tell you uh, when to do, what to do, and uh, why. But at the end of the day, you've really got to decide what you want from your uh, bees and beekeeping so that you can prepare uh, for, what, for what you want. <clears throat> what management techniques will you use uh, this coming uh, season? Are they going to be the same as you did last year? Are they going to be different? If you've heard of something that's different or you've seen something, I suggest very strongly that if you make any changes, you actually do it on half your colonies uh, because then you've still got the control of the old way you did it so that um, you, can, uh, you can work out if it's going to uh, be an improvement or not. But don't forget what might be an improvement one year may not 
be uh, the next. <laughs> so have a look, work these things out, uh, perhaps make notes or whatever. Um, so when the, when the season comes, you're actually prepared. Please, please, please don't forget the uh, problems we're having with Queens these days. Uh, I've got a whole page on Dave Cushman's website. And those of you that have come into beekeeping since the turn of the century <coughs> will probably take these um, uh, these problems as, uh, as the norm. Um, but so you know what they are, there's three main problems really, which is a young queen's being superseded uh, very often in their first year, uh, sometimes even uh, before I've seen them uh, attempted supersede uh, before the first brood is sealed. Whereas normally it would be at the end of the queen's life after oh, three, four, five, sometimes uh, six years. Young queen's failing. Um, and I think I can show you. No, I don't think I can on, the, on this program. Um, yeah, um, all sorts of little things happen, like you get uh, drones in uh, worker cells, singly in worker cells. So if you get one patch of um, uh, worker brood, you might get several drones in worker cells. That's a real sign. And um, they, they can go down very, very uh, quickly. Sorry. And the other thing is queens simply disappearing. You go to the colony on one, <clears throat> one inspection uh, and everything's fine. Queen's laying fine, no trouble at all. You go there 10, 12, 14 days later or, or whatever um, you, you do as your inspection um, regime, uh, Queen's gone. So those are, the, those are things that we need to uh, be aware of and work out how we're going to put them right when the, um, when the time comes. Um, <clears throat> It's not always new beekeepers that uh, that um, uh, have a look for ideas of um, uh, uh, different ways of doing things. So uh, you probably uh, uh, consulted various resources. It could even be very old books. And I'm, I'm, I'm scanning through some very old books at the moment. And some of them, and I'm talking about 1880 to 1900, some of them, are, if, you, if you forget... Um, the sort of scientific discoveries and the various bits and pieces like all see rape coming in and, and Varroa since they've um, since they were published. Uh, there's some very good um, uh, uh, sound information in some of those old books. Planning is important, I think, as far as uh, beekeeping is concerned. So let's just look at knowledge and experience. And you really do need to know the basics. And I'm talking about things like life cycles, what happens in the colony when it's preparing to swarm, disease recognition, uh, life cycle of Roa, all those sort of things. And I have to say that I've I regularly come across people who've been keeping bees 20 years or so that simply do not know the life cycles. So um, if you know them, absolutely fine. Probably we're not going to get those sort of people um, listening to a webinar, but um, uh, if you've got people in your local area that don't know things like that, then try and try and help them if you possibly can. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you need to decide what you want. So um, how many honey producing colonies uh, do you actually want? Okay, there'll be a little bit one way or the other, perhaps um, something goes wrong and um, one, uh, one doesn't produce. But within shouting distance, I think all good sound beekeepers will know what they, um, what they can manage, uh, the amount of space they got um, for honey producing colonies and within a little bit, they'll, they'll stick to it. But I regularly come across even quite experienced beekeepers, 10, 15, 20 years or so, and um, they're up and down, up and down, up and down. And the reason is because they don't know what to do when their colonies swarm, other than just put it in another box or do an artificial swarm or something like that, which of course will give them extra colonies uh, anyway. <coughs> How many colonies do you want to put in the next winter? Now that might sound, of um, course, cool, so it's a long way away, but what I try to do if I can, I try to encourage other beekeepers to, 
is that um, if you can put more colonies into winter, about 10, 15, 20%, perhaps even 25% uh, more, then if you do have losses, you've made up your uh, winter losses before they actually happen. Now, now's the time to start thinking about things like that because of course you need to make up extra kit or find it or buy it or, 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 or whatever for, for that. <clears throat> Management. Um, most people tend to work on um, col uh, cycles of either seven or 14 days for colony inspections or somewhere in between. Uh, some do eight, nine, 12 or, or whatever. That's absolutely fine. Um, but if perhaps your circumstances have changed, so you now can only be a weekend beekeeper, perhaps your job's changed or something of that nature, um, then you can easily work on seven and 14 uh, days, but you might need to work out how you're going to do it. Now's the time to do it. Not when you're um, uh, in front of a hive uh, with a frame in one hand uh, and, uh, and a notebook in the other. <laughs> What swarm prevention and control are you going to use is exactly what you've used uh, throughout um, all your beekeeping uh, life. Or do you want to try something that might be a bit different? Uh, perhaps uh, something with, uh, with a board in, just for argument's sake. Well, you need to make the uh, board up. But again, I suggest, unless you've only got a small number of colonies, do it on half the number of uh, colonies. So perhaps if you're doing something different, perhaps um, on every other colony that prepares to swarm, if indeed that's the way you're going to do it. If you're going to make increase and you're in uh, the area or your uh, local association is a BDI member, make sure you don't go over the, um, uh, the, the number that you're insured for. Otherwise, you uh, you you won't get um, uh, you won't get any compensation if you uh, if your bees do um, contract um, uh, either either of the foul broods. So now's the time to uh, to do it, and it's probably better to go a few colonies over than run the risk of um, of being uninsured. <sighs> Colony assessment is something I don't think a lot of beekeepers do. Um, uh, they might do when they get indoors and say, uh, crikey, they were, uh, the, they were little devils today. Um, but are they actually looking at their colonies? Are they assessing them for perhaps uh, temper, calmness on the comb? Simple sort of things that, um, uh, that are there all the time. They're easy to pick up uh, and they're also quite easy to record as well. Um, so if you haven't done it, then perhaps that's something you can do. Perhaps now's the time to put an extra column on your um, on your record sheet. <sighs> um, what do you want to produce? Uh, we got to remember that um, a colony of bees is producing something all the time during the summer. Now, it could be honey or it could be extra bees, or perhaps it could be extra queens. Um, these days, um, there are nowhere near as many people interested in the honey than they, than, than they used to be. Uh, when I started, everybody was interested in honey, and a lot of people worked on farms or on the land in some way, and had anything from 15 up to perhaps 50 colonies, and they sold the honey at the garden gate to augment what we usually uh, low low wages. That's not the case now. A lot of people coming into beekeeping for other reasons. But even if you don't want honey, that's fine because what you can do is you can perhaps produce the odd nuke or a few queens or something like that for other members of your um, beekeeping association or just to just sell. And what's the difference between uh, getting some money back um, for the expenses of your hobby uh, by selling um, uh, a few bees or, uh, or or a little bit of a uh, little bit of honey. Now, the resources I mentioned, <coughs> we've obviously got the NBU and uh, the bee base. If you rummage around uh, quite a bit, there's quite a lot of useful uh, leaflets and uh, uh, and booklets in 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 all sorts of odd odd places. 
they tend to be going online these days, so you can perhaps just print out a PDF or something of that nature. NIBS, which is a Native Irish Honeybee Society, they've got um, a series of booklets. I think there's about a dozen now. Uh, the Scottish Native Honeybee Society, I think they've got some stuff on their website. And of course, uh, Bibber, we, we've got some. And we're also um, uh, looking at getting some, uh, uh, some more written. So there's going to be quite a stream probably in the next um, uh, 12 months or so. <coughs> uh, events. Okay, this is uh, uh, this presentation is probably 12, 15 years old now, but perhaps webinars as well. There are some quite good ones out there, but the great thing about a webinar is if you uh, if after 10 minutes you think, crikey, this is a bit grim, uh, you can uh, you, you can go back and uh, uh, and do something else, can't you? Of course, the Dave Cushman's website I mentioned. Um, your own teachers locally, um, you know, listen to them because they're, they're there for uh, a reason. And I hope some of the things I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm not undermining uh, your teachers. Your own observations, that's a brilliant way to, um, uh, to learn and to learn new, new things as well, because the best teachers by a very long way, in my opinion, are bees. So the planning side of it, as I've already said, is important. If you do something this week, <coughs> or let's put it this way, let's say last inspection then, um, uh, and you think, oh, the, the, the bees should have done this, that or the other, uh, don't believe it because um, they've got a, a better sense of humour than me. And uh, they may well change your mind for you, but don't worry too much because um, a lot of... Um, beekeeping is done on the hoof anyway but even if you plan what you hope to do if you change it in two or three months time um don't uh, uh, don't be frightened of, of change try new things as i um as suggested and perhaps you can think of setting yourself up self up a few little experiments <sighs> you may recall some of the uh, simple experiments that I've done myself. I've written about the sort of things like, say, where um, we take a queen away from a, a colony, how long does it take for them to start queen cells, uh, emergency uh, queen cells? Uh, well, I only did four colonies at the same time, uh, and they were all over the place. But the books will probably tell you that they um, that they do it after I don't know, 12 hours or 48 hours or whatever. Um, just experiment. Make sure you've got uh, control and um, you, you, you do it reasonably scientifically, not just do it once and assume it all bees the same because they're not. <clears throat> um, those of you who've heard my uh, presentations before will know that I try to get uh, my brew combs drawn out in preparation. Um, and I'll explain that um, in not in any great detail, but I'll explain that in a, in a in a minute. Also, the Patterson unit, which is now becoming well known, comb honey as well. Uh, when I started keeping bees, an awful lot of beekeepers produced comb honey. Very very few uh, do now, and it's something I'd like to see resurrected. So <clears throat> these. Um, uh, 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 brood combs in. Uh, how I do it is I have brood chambers that I use as supers. Uh, and you can see, hang on, let's get the pointer. You can see there is the uh, queen excluder. And what I do is I put foundation in uh, the brood box on narrow spacing, obviously, put it above the uh, uh, queen excluder. <clears throat> I like to have. One, at least one or possibly two supers above. And the reason for that is that as soon as the uh, bees start drawing this one out in the brood chamber, I then swap them uh, 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 around. So the supers at the bottom, and you'll find out why in a little bit, um, a, a little bit later. So anyway, um, the benefits of that are that in, in my experience, bees dry out far better brood combs because uh, if you put foundation in the brood chamber, if the weather is uh, poor for a week or so, 
uh, the bees don't work it, they don't build it out. And of course, as we all know, or should know, bees don't produce comb uh, unless they've got an income with which to, um, uh, uh, to produce the wax to, to make the comb. Uh, so they, they climb all over it. <clears throat> you get another week's bare weather uh, and the bees chew holes in it. Out comes the sun and the bees then decide they're gonna um, uh, build comb wherever they like. Now, because the brood chamber has got a lot more bees in, uh, or it's, it's much more um, uh, populous than the supers, that doesn't happen in the supers because if, uh, if there's foundation, they don't need it, the bees just don't, um, don't climb all over it. Um, if you want food combs, such as for a nuke or something like that, which is um, running a bit short of food, just go into one of the uh, brew chambers and you've got it immediately. You haven't got to go charging in, indoors, make up syrup, feed in the evening and all that sort of uh, palaver. Also, your comb builders have got work. You can uncap them nice and straight, uh, extract them, and then you've got brood combs instantly available. So the queen can quickly lay in them and you get a much quicker build up. Now you can start doing the planning now. You can even make your frames up now. I suggest you don't put the foundation in, but you can you can you 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 can buy your frames, buy your foundation, so everything is uh, is ready for you. Now with this, of course, the foundation doesn't go uh, stale by uh, travel, and you uh, if you hear any of my other talks where I include this as a, as a bigger element, there's much more f flexibility. But what I do is usually get them on on early. I'm in an oil seed rape area. So uh, if I put a foundation on perhaps early May, uh, by certainly early June, uh, I've got some decent uh, brood combs. And they will actually store for some time, the, you know, several years if you, um, if you look after them and make sure the mice don't get at them. If you have got larger combs and your extractor won't take them, um, don't worry, you can just use it for winter feed. Here's where, what they are, and after extraction, you get that um, rather than something like that. I'm, I'm going to whiz through this because um, I want to make some um, uh, more points uh, later on. Now, the Patterson unit, um, I dreamt up about 15 years ago now, I suppose, in response to the problem with the queens. Because what I was finding was the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the honey producing colonies were getting robbed to um, uh, to provide queens or uh, frames of brood or whatever if one of the others went down. So this is what this is a whisper green teaching apne or the the old one anyway. Uh, and we've always had well say always for the last 10, 12, might even be 15 years now, we've always had one group that um, uh, that just does the Pat Patterson unit and that's it. And that's what you need around about four colonies. Uh, three is okay. Two, you could do it with two or you could do it with six. It really doesn't matter. Now, <clears throat> to keep them going, keep them fully productive, we have what I call a support colony. And if I want a queen or a frame of brood or something like that, that's where it comes from. And that little colony generally works incredibly hard during the uh, summer. I say little colony because of course it can be a big colony as well, but you need to hear the, the whole lecture in order to, um, uh, or the whole presentation rather, because I don't lecture to anyone, uh, to um, uh, to hear that. You see there, it's not a double brew chamber. I always work on single brew chambers. Um, uh, that is of course being um, uh, drawn out for um, a comb, so there's foundation in there. So the benefits of that then, you get much fle more flexible management, helps overcome the modern problems, the queen problems I was telling you about. You also got support colonies, which can be overwintered, because don't forget uh, one in five is, um, uh, uh, you know, you're putting 20, 25 percent extra into uh, winter. So you make up for winter losses before, before they happen. Good for making increase as well because uh, you can generally split those a couple of times during the year. And the great benefit is that all honey producing colonies are fully productive. 
Old brood combs can be easily replaced, <coughs> and you've got spare queens if you if you want to. There's also an opportunity to to cull poor bees too. So if one of the queens in those bigger colonies um, wasn't that great for whatever reason, uh, out comes one from the uh, support colony into there, and then just raise another one in the support support colony. Now comb honey. Personally, I think it's the best way to eat honey. <clears throat> I was born and brought up on a farm, so I know what drinking uh, milk straight from the cow or the goat um, uh, is like, and it's, it's a different world. Exactly the same with honey. I don't know what it is about the extracting process, but the honey seems to lose the, um, uh, certainly fine honey does, um, uh, cert or with fine aroma, seems to lose the aroma somehow and I, I i don't know why and i've never even 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 heard why okay you do get a few bits of wax in your in your mouth but you can find a way of um, getting rid of them great thing about it is you don't need extracting equipment and um that's why perhaps for beginners um that's not a bad way of um of, of keeping your bees why buy an extractor? You're only using one or two days a year and spending quite a lot of money on it. <sighs> There's no bottling or storage uh, a problem uh, either. Um, not, um, or certainly not, um, uh, you know, things like fermentation or anything like that. I suggest very strongly that you poke them in a the freezer for a, a week or so. Um, now, some people say you can't freeze honey oh why would you put it in that right to kill off the uh, wax moth uh, eggs mainly the uh, the greater wax moth eggs uh, yeah i was going to say uh, people say you can't freeze honey um but i was in switzerland on one occasion and virtually all the um uh, the beekeepers there were freezing their honey and they were keeping it in the freezer um now i don't really know why apart from just to, to uh um uh, uh, kill off the wax moth don't let it granulate so obviously don't um don't put comb honey on when you've got um uh, oil seed rape about although having said that i've known several people beekeepers included who do actually like granulated comb honey um i'm not keen on it but there it is and of course it's unlikely to ferment well you could use wooden sections which is really the old-fashioned way of doing it now but Virtually everybody produced these when I started keeping bees. <clears throat> um, uh, they are a bit of a fiddle and the bees don't always like them. Uh, or you could use the round plastic ones. Um, the only problem I see with them is the, uh, the, the cost because I think we're looking about 60 or 80 pounds for a full, full super now. But of course, what you can do is do a cut comb. So you just need a sheet of a thin foundation in um, in brew combs, uh, uh, sorry, in super combs, and away you go. <clears throat> You'll have to edit that bit out, Richard, that mistake. Um, <clears throat> so apron equipment now. Well, now's the time to cut trees, hedges, and that sort of thing, so don't, um, uh, don't tear your veil. Have a look at your stands. Make sure they're sound. Make sure they're of comfortable height, too. Were they... A few inches too low or too high last year? Did they make your back ache? Um, you know, all those sort of things. Now's the time to do it, especially at the moment, because um, with your bees uh, 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 tucked up, all you got to do is just block the entrance up, uh, move them to one side, do what you have to do, put them back, and they won't even know you've been there. <clears throat> we all have things that annoy us, don't we? Uh, well, I do. Uh, so I assume you do as well. All sorts of things, the, the, the low tree branch that you bang your head on, um, something that you trip over, or the rabbit hole, or, or, or the, the nail that's sticking out of a, uh, a brood chain that you keep catching yourself on, all sorts of things like that. Get it sorted out now. Don't wait till, uh, uh, till uh, later. Uh, your hive tool that you didn't like last year because it wasn't easy to use. Get yourself another one. Get it sorted. Get it sorted now. <clears throat> of course, winter's good for cleaning, mending, replacing, 
uh, kit as well. And ordering what you need, <clears throat> I suggest strongly that you uh, uh, get a bit more. Uh, perhaps the sales are the right place uh, to get them. I don't know. Uh, now we haven't got any physical meetings. Of course, uh, the sort of National Honey Show and BBK Spring Convention and those sort of things aren't, um, aren't available. But the manufacturers, I think, have responded, or the suppliers rather, and manufacturers have responded quite well. And they, um, they are um, uh, uh, making sure that we, uh, uh, we, 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 we get the kit we want. If you only want a dozen frames, um, I suggest strongly that you buy a pack of 50 because you will use them uh, at, at, at some stage. <clears throat> if you buy foundation early, and I suggest you do because very often if you get a, a, a good summer, the suppliers run out just when you want it. Now, despite what you might be told, I think foundation actually stores quite well. You can certainly keep it stored for two or three years without any problem, but make sure it's flat. So put it down on a board or a shelf or something like, like, like that uh, with another one on top of it, piece of plywood. And then um, if you like a little bit of a weight, um, a couple of bricks or your wallet or, you know, you know something, something that's nice and heavy. Um, it's much better that than getting to uh, second week in June, uh, run out of combs. The sun's absolutely um, uh, 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 scorching everything. Um, the bees are, are, are bringing in loads of uh, uh, nectar and got nowhere to put it. <clears throat> Get supers ready. Now, personally, I think um, rain, arranging supers is an art. I know a lot of people take the supers off one year to stuff them in the shed, and that's how they put them in uh, on the bees next year. I don't do that. <sighs> and I'll tell you what I do. Um, supers, uh, the part of the cleaning up is done at extraction time of uh, super combs. What I do is I run the knife along the top bars and the bottom bars of the uh, frames. Uh, when it's nice and easy to do, very often there's honey there as well, or wax or whatever. It just goes straight into the uncapping um, tray. Uh, there's your winter work on the frames, or most of the frames are done anyway. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you a little bit about where to put uh, them uh, in the super, where to put the frames I I in a minute, and for the, for the reasons. I like to uncap with a knife because I can then uncap dead straight. If you use um, uncapping fork or a, uh, a heat gun or anything of that nature, what you end up with is uh, usually uh, quite a wavy surface. That then doesn't give you a straight surface next year. But if you if you uncap them nice and nice and straight, uh, the bees will draw them out and they will they will cap them next year nice and straight. So it's nice and easy to um uh, uh to uncap next year <laughs> right take all your super frames out obviously clean the boxes up and then sort your super frames if you've got any that are um built out really well put them all to one side if you've got any with holes in or uh, the bees have made a very good uh, job of them put them all to another side so if you've got some with holes in or they're damaged, what you can do is if, if they're damaged or the bees are built crossways as they occasionally do, just cut that bed out and put anything that's damaged on narrow spacing so that you don't get a hole opposite a hole. Otherwise the bees will build um, through. So set them up so that um, uh, so the bees can then build you good combs for the next year. And I promise you that if you've done it right, uh, they will. So I think setting supers up is actually quite, um, uh, there's quite an art. Now, the reason I said put the uh, well-drawn-out ones to one side is if you've perhaps got 
uh, some quite bad ones, don't just dump them because the bees will, if you, if you, um, uh, if you do a good job of them, the, the bees will as well. What you can do is put poor comb, um, yeah, poor, poor, poor combs between good ones and they'll, um, they'll, they'll, they should do a really good job of it. Okay, um, I'm suggesting you don't do this too late, uh, too early rather, <clears throat> do it fairly late. So get into Marchish, and the reason is simple, that you very rarely, well, I've never ever heard it from anywhere else. What happens is if you do it, let's say in November, <coughs> excuse me, if you do it in November, uh, what happens in, in go the spiders, they put a load of webs in there, you just take them out of the shed, put them straight on the bees, and what happens, of course, poor little bees just get caught up in the spider's webs. If you do that, uh, when you put them on the, on the uh, bees, just take the frames out, take the spider's webs uh, off, and they should, should be okay. So, all right. Sorry I spent a little bit of time on that, but actually I think it's quite important because it makes it, makes it much easier for you to come extracting time because it then makes your uncapping easier. <clears throat> Record sheets and cards. I guess most beekeepers these days have, have got them, but have you got columns you don't use? Uh, could you perhaps use those columns to record something else that you, uh, you, you, you wished you recorded last year? Have a look at it, review things all the time. <clears throat> right, now coming down to the point I was making about the, um, uh, the uh, brew chamber used as, uh, as a super. How many people moan about pollen in uh, super combs? But how many people actually know the reason why bees put it there? Well, the reason they do is because bees usually only put pollen in worker comb. They don't, well, they very, very rarely will they put um, pollen in drone comb. <clears throat> So, when you're setting up your supers, if you've got a mixture, what I do is put the drone comb in the uh, middle of the, um, uh, of the supers and the worker comb on the outside. Because what happens is that this uh, super frame was in a super immediately above the brew chamber. And when that happens, what happens is you get this little arch of pollen here where the bees have put the pollen above their brood because they don't recognize queen excluders. They think that they can just go uh, up and uh, use it. And of course they can't. Um, so that is why you get uh, pollen in super combs. <clears throat> and that was that very same comb extracted. Look at it, 50% of it, or perhaps even more, is well, it's not it's not pollen, it's bee bread, but you know, you, you, you know what I mean. And of course, what happens is um, the uh, beekeeper uh, swears about it, um, extract it, the extractor goes out of balance, um, they swear some more, put it back in the uh, supers, put it in the shed, and it all all goes mouldy by next next spring, and it's no good to the bees, completely lost uh, to them. Whereas if you put drone comb immediately above the uh, the brood nest, uh, you don't get that and the bees put the pollen where they should do. <clears throat> so there's a drone comb that's uh, happened exactly the same as the worker comb and that area there they usually leave empty. I don't know why, I assume it's the, uh, they think the queen can come up and lay in it. But if you move that super up and put another one underneath the bees to fill that up so that's one one tip if you uh, if you don't want pollen in your supers then use um use drone comb <clears throat> i don't know how many times i've been asked by beekeepers why their bees put a comb build comb underneath the frames well the reason is that um it's a depth of floor because the manufacturers make two depths, a uh, deep one, which is, I think, about 20 or 22 millimetres, and a shallow one, which is about 10. With the shallow one, 
the bees can walk in straight onto the bottom of the frame and up they go. With the deep uh, one, they can't do that. So what they do is they build either underneath the comb or on the on the floor so they've got um they got somewhere to climb up that's really all that's been done <clears throat> um and it, it is a nuisance uh in more ways than one if you want to put that let's say in a second brood chamber or or you know all sorts of things that beekeepers want to do um you've then got to um uh then got to cut it off worse still what happens <clears throat> Nice place for queen cells to be uh, 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 to be to be built, and there's one there. Now, a lot of people will actually miss that, but that on its own can mean that somebody else has got a chimney full of bees they don't want. So, I always put a shallow uh, floor, and I don't get the um, uh, the comb underneath the uh, bottom bars. Um, the same as other people do um, uh, is actually one of the problems one of the reasons I don't like poly nuke boxes because of the great big gap which is far more than 20 millimeters now whilst we're on it <clears throat> just looking at a comb nothing to do with uh, preparation but just looking at a comb you can actually tell quite a bit about it um, you've got all the food over here on the right hand side Bees always put food um, as far away from the entrance as they can, so you can you can um, uh, you can say that the entrance was down here on the bottom left-hand corner, which is confirmed by this gap down the front here, because bees very often put some um, uh, put a gap uh, there, which they don't uh, at the back. We've got clearly granulated stores here, and. That up below that line there is also granulated. You can see the darker color. That there is, is okay. So a few things you can tell about that, um, that comb. Also, um, what I said earlier about um, drones in worker cells, look at this lot here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a dozen or so uh, on there. They're singles, so they've got to be drones in uh, worker cells so you can actually tell quite a bit about that to uh, that comb but that's only a, a sort of a side <clears throat> so the bees themselves ensure they've got enough food um now i don't normally bother too much with my bees because they're 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 really good i'll feed them down single brood chamber feed them down in the autumn uh my spring feeding is done in the autumn i um, i very rarely have to feed in the spring unless it's a very long spring so, but make sure, just keep hefting them. At the moment, they're frozen down, which is, uh, you know, um, I expect the same everywhere. <clears throat> and only feed if they need it. I come across so many beekeepers, they give them a, frame, uh, some, uh, a pack of fondant for Christmas or something, uh, and then they keep feeding fondant, will they need it or not? Problem is, if you do that, uh, and the bees do actually put some in the combs they don't always put fondant in the combs but sometimes they do um, and of course that is going to crowd the um, uh, uh, crowd the queens out and even start about thinking about early inspections now I know it's only halfway within halfway through uh, February yet think about your early inspections um, get get things ready uh, perhaps spring cleaning um, <clears throat> so clean your kit up now for all your crown boards, your floors, and all, all, all those um, uh, all those bits and pieces. When you get there, um, is the queen uh, laying? Uh, you need you need to know that. Now you can do certainly in my area in West Sussex. Most most springs, even early March, I can get in on just quickly have a look in in the colony, make sure everything's uh, uh, okay. And there's uh, there's no problems. Now's the time to have a look for at fowl brood because um, uh, there aren't that many bees in the hive. And just a quick look, and um, uh, that, that's all you need to do. You haven't got to do a full inspection. But one thing you can do is super early. And one of the things the old beekeepers used to do was, um, and I don't actually know if it worked or not. Um, but they they felt that if they put a super on a hive early, 
um, it will be extra space for the bees to warm up. So what they did was they put a couple of sheets of newspaper over the brood chamber and then a super on top of that. So when the bees needed the super, they just seat to, to the um, uh, newspaper and the, they got it. Um, I've done it occasionally in the last uh, few years. Um, I don't know, perhaps it's something that ought to be uh, resurrected, but perhaps somebody's um, uh, had a look and said, well, it doesn't actually make any difference. I don't know. <clears throat> you need to get your supers on early because if you get them on a little bit late, um, this is what happens. You've got an expanding brood uh, nest in the uh, spring. Uh, it'll probably be towards the top of the um, uh, 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 the top of the brood chamber. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Very often in the spring, uh, you get two or three days or even a week or more of uh, really good weather. Now, in the spring, uh, I find certainly in my area with things like Withy, you know, the um, uh, willow, uh, say it's Capria, goat willow, call it what you like, pussy willow, um, and things like dandelions, bees can bring in a huge amount of uh, pollen and nectar um well um what happens is if they've got nowhere to put it they pack it around the brood as as you'd expect them to do and there's a comb there where it's actually happened <clears throat> because this was where the queen had laid there was obviously a spare area here before you got to the food uh in came the pollen bees have got nowhere to put it so they put it in the empty um, empty um, uh, cells there. Uh, okay, pollen is something that um, uh, you probably don't want to discourage from putting in the supers, but perhaps the nectar that came in could have gone in the super and um, uh, the bees would then be able to put the pollen where the, uh, where, where the nectar is. But that's the sort of thing that happens. And uh, it can happen very, very quickly uh, dur during the spring. So then, of course, um, the, the, they pack it out. You've got trouble looming then because once you've got uh, pollen in, uh, in cells uh, and even sealed stores too, it's very difficult to get the bees to, sh to shift it. You've then got to do some sort of manipulation in order to, um, uh, 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 to help them out. You then get a knock-on effect because once the queen is um, uh, prevented from laying, that causes problems. So, of course, up go the queen cells, and you, you, that, I think, is one of the main reasons why we tend to get um, uh, swarms in, in mid-April or whatever. Now, if you put the super on, that's where the nectar can go. Where the nectar went in the brood chamber, perhaps the pollen can go. And in any case, if the queen can lay more, they're going to use more of it anyway, so allowing the colony to expand like that. So it's basically, you know, fairly simple. And I think an awful lot of swarming problems are caused because the beekeeper uh, doesn't get the um, supers on quick enough. Now, it depends on your district what you do, because you're going to um, you're going to have different situations. <clears throat> I suggest, if you can, to get foundation on at the right time. I prefer to put it on early in the season rather than late because then the bees have got a chance to, to build it out um, uh, and draw good combs. Whereas if it was the last um, uh, to, go, um, uh, to go on because you've run out of drawn comb, perhaps in July, back end of July, the bees are going to climb, uh, climb all over it and, um, uh, and uh, that's it. Incidentally, one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about supers was rotate your supers. So if you haven't used any this year, make sure they're the ones that you use first next year. Greater wax moth doesn't really cause much of a problem with uh, virgin comb that's had no brooding. But um, despite what the books and some teachers will tell you, uh, <clears throat> lesser wax moth will actually make quite a mess of virgin comb. It takes them a lot longer to do it, but, um, uh, but, but they can do it. Anyway, okay, sorry about a diversion. Make sure early on you've got plenty of space in advance, and I'd much rather put two supers on 
uh, than none and, and ha ha have the bees swarm. Because very often I find if they attempt to swarm early, it's much more difficult to try and uh, prevent them from doing it than, uh, than if it was later. Um, <clears throat> collect smoker fuel. I really like touchwood. You get something like this uh, and you can just break it up into pieces and you can, um, uh, uh, you can then uh, uh, use it in your smoker. As my, a lot of you know, I've got a couple of uh, border collies that are down by the side of me here. One's munching on a bone, by the way. I uh, hope you can't hear, can't hear too much of her. Um, if I'm running a bit short, I've got an old rucksack. Uh, I just uh, want to take them out for a walk. Uh, I put um, bits in the rucksack, bring them home in the greenhouse, perhaps to dry them out. And um, of course, I've got free smoker fuel that is really good. It burns a long time and um, uh, I find it really good. <sighs> but you can do that now. <clears throat> Prepare your swarm collecting kit too. And um, <clears throat> a lot of people don't seem to realize that if you have a, a swarm call, um, you really ought to get out and, um, uh, and get, it, get it sorted. Don't, uh, uh, don't spend a, a, an hour and a half trying to, fi trying to find your kit. Get it there ready. And what I'll do is I've, in fact, I've got two skips. Well, three, if you take into account the one with several holes in, but uh, two, I've got two skeps because sometimes I'll pick up two swarms a day. Um, and inside them, uh, I've got um, various uh, uh, bits and bits and pieces. Now, if you haven't got a skep, <clears throat> uh, a box is quite good and probably the only useful um, thing I've found to do with a, a poly nuke box because they really are quite good for this, um, uh, the, this sort of thing. You need some sort of cloth. Make sure it's breathable. So something fairly loose woven, hessian or something of that nature is good. In the old days, we had um, uh, sacks or bran pokes or something like that. These days, uh, bricklayers use uh, hessian for covering up um, uh, the bricks they've laid in frosty weather. So go and have a bit of a chat with them and see if you see if you you can uh, you you can get some of that. You need a cloth. Um, if I haven't got it later, you also need some string to tie it round too. So bale of twine is brilliant for that. <clears throat> queen cage isn't very important. Oh, queen cage. Um, what I've got is a little bit of wire, um, about uh, six inches long, I suppose. Um, and uh, and that's fixed to the queen cage. So that uh, if, I, if I do find the queen, I'll put her in the cage. Um, and then just push the wire through the through the skep, um, and um, uh, turn it over at the top end. And uh, once I've got the queen, of course, I've got the swarm as well. I've always got clipping and marking kit in my car anyway, but I suggest you take it. it doesn't have to be marking a marking kit, but certainly something to clip the queen's wings because something could go wrong. Uh, she flies off and you've uh, um, all of a sudden got your swarm up the top of a poplar tree, which is, is not the best place to get them down from, or holly trees either. <clears throat> Take a high tool and smoker. Uh, smoker because you can drive bees just a little bit. Don't over smoke a swarm, whatever you do, because um, um, you'll, 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 you'll drive them and, and um, uh, they'll probably go in, in the wrong direction. Hive tools, it's surprising what you need something for, perhaps to, um, uh, to leave away a bit of wood or, 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 or something uh, uh, something like that. Oh, string, yeah, I've got that, yeah. Old comb's useful because if you've got a, a swarm in a, in a hedge or somewhere that's a bit in, in, inaccessible, um, put an old comb over it and most of the time the bees will... Um, uh, uh, will come up onto the comb and then of course you can um, uh, shake them uh, into your box. <laughs> <sighs> Saw and secateurs as well, but don't chop somebody's um, um, uh, well manicured uh, 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 trees a bit. Um, there are other things that you could use. Uh, a pillowcase could be quite useful because um, 
uh, on some occasions I've uh, collected a swarm by just putting a pillowcase straight over the swarm and um, uh, snipping the, uh, uh, the the branches. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful because um, uh, the bees can sting you through the um, uh, um, uh, through the pillowcases. Um, when my children were young, um, young bed, um, young uh, uh, small beds, um, on a couple of occasions, I'm afraid I borrowed their juve uh, covers, their little juve covers, and I found they were uh, quite useful as well. Um, damage on hives. Um, this was a beekeeping association close to me uh, that I visited one. Um, well, in fact, I was asked to demonstrate. Uh, and my group had finished what we were doing. And we looked behind us and there was somebody taping up the um, uh, boxes on another one. And the reason they were taping them up is because there's so many holes in the boxes that the bees were going in as, 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 as they felt. Uh, through where they felt. Um, that, that was too early for wasps, but um, later on the wasps would have been in there. So perhaps um, uh, get your repairs done. This is a corner of a, a, a super or a brew box, I think, obviously an old one. Um, and I've, I've, I've just repaired it. Get your repairs in now, not, not later. I mentioned... Uh, uh, well, I think I mentioned records uh, earlier. Here's mine, and I don't want to appear too clever or anything uh, with these or, or actually tell you what to do. Um, but I, as an experienced beekeeper, I don't need to record a lot of the things that other, uh, other people do because I can see it in the colony. So um, what I've done here is I've got a, a sheet, an A4 sheet, and it suits, suits a whole colony for a year. And if you're, if you're not satisfied with your current method, then get on to uh, the computer, knock something up. You can always change it later. And this is what I've done. Um, I've got 19 lines across, so I've got, I can have 19 entries. It's um, uh, a record sheet for a colony for a year. Now, if you've got clip queens, you're probably <clears throat> inspecting your colonies about 15 times a year, perhaps up to 20. If you've got unclip queens, you, if you do them when you should do, and to, to avoid swarming, you're probably inspecting your colonies 25 times uh, a year, uh, or perhaps up to 30. So I, I clip my queens, and um, uh, 19 usually does me okay. So I've got the date and I've got three columns, yes or no. And I'll just cross out what, um, uh, what I don't want. Is the queen laying? Is she clipped and marked? Are there any queen cells? <clears throat> That's really all I need. If I don't see the queen, uh, I don't put anything in that column. So I know when the last time I was, was I saw. Now two columns that I think are quite important. And then that bit... <clears throat> um, have done it in a, in, a, in, in a different way, but they're recording the same things. I've got one column for temper, one for calmness on the comb. They are quite important characteristics for colony for me, and I need to know what's happening. Don't worry about the figures. You can use whatever you like in there, or you can just give a tick or a cross or, 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 um, or, or whatever you like. It doesn't really matter. If you're recording it and you can understand it, that's fine. And then there's a comments column. Now, if you can take something from that, that's absolutely fine. Um, there is one on the Whisper Green, my local association website. You're more than welcome to download it. <clears throat> if you want to uh, modify it to suit yourself, you can do so or set something up yourself. I think it's quite important that you have records that you understand and, can that, and other people can understand them if perhaps uh, you're real or something like, like that. So um, uh, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, mine are keeping <clears throat> in the top of the hive. Uh, I've got a plastic document wallet and a, a, a clipboard. And I don't know what they cost on uh, £1.50 for the whole lot. Uh, it last you a, a lifetime, if you like. So they're in there. And every time I open the lid, I can immediately see 
what the um, uh, what state the colony's in. Now, whilst we're here, um, you'll notice that um, that rim is um, deeper than the normal ground board. Why is it deeper than the normal ground board? Because what I do is when I put um, uh, Apigard on, and no, I'm not advertising, but when I put Apigard on, all I do is just turn that upside down and there's my rim there. I haven't got to worry about a, a, an eek. So if you want to take up that idea, if you haven't already done it, because it's a brilliant idea, um, then you've got uh, got a few weeks left in order to um, uh, 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 to put them on there. Don't go charging off buying wood. Just have a look around the local neighbourhood and see what's in skips, because that's all I did. <clears throat> um, be patient for putting foundation in. You can see what's happened here. It has, it has sunk. So if you're going to put foundation in uh, before you need it, hang your frame straight and you don't get that happening. Making frames, <clears throat> oh dear, oh dear. We're always told that we must put our nails in going through that way. Why is that? Because it's nice and easy uh, to take the bottom bars out of frames uh, to, to clean them. Uh, well, that's okay, but I have come across ever so many where the bottom bars have come out in use and they're left inside the hive. So what I do, you don't have to do the same as me, but this is what I do. I put the nail down through there so it doesn't happen. So there we go, and that's fine. And this is what happens. And it happens because uh, the bees propolize down or you know, put, put comb um, between the bottom bars of one, uh, one uh, frame and the top bars of the other. And I've seen that happen so many times. I've been the uh, auctioneer at West Sussex Auction for um, over 30 years now, apparently. <clears throat> And ever since the auction started in about 1973, I've inspected the bees that, came, that have come in for, um, uh, you know, sold and given appraisal before selling them. One year there was um, a lady brought a WBC hive in. She was giving, um, giving up bee chem. She brought a WBC hive in and out of 10 frames in the brood chamber, seven of them lost the bottom bars and they were, le that they were left behind. So, um, you know, it, it's a common problem. Just quite frankly, I would, if I was uh, you folk, well, I've done it myself. If I get um, frames coming from somewhere else, but nailed in that way, I always put a nail through the other way. Because when you get um, a situation like this, it's actually quite difficult to replace that, that, um, uh, that um, uh, bottom bar. And why the... Um, why the BBK basic have to do it that way, I've no idea. I have come across people who've been who've told me that they've been told that they've got to take it to bits and do it properly. Anyway, <clears throat> if you don't do this, think about it now. What I do and what I said myself and I suggest to everybody else I teach is that the first frame out of every hive that's got brood in all stages, check the sealed brood for signs of AFB unsealed brood for signs of EFB. And um, it's, it, it's ever so easy to shake the bees off. You don't have to shake all of them off. And I do it at every inspection, not the first and last inspections of the years like, um, uh, like, like we're told to. And it's actually a habit now, um, you know, because I've been doing it for so long. <clears throat> it's good fun uh, picking up bees, uh, especially if they belong to somebody else. So get your bait hive ready, and all you need is an old box. Could be anything. It really could. It could be uh, one super. Might be a bit on the small side. Might not be attractive to bees. Uh, so perhaps a couple of supers with, with an old comb in it. That's all you need. Uh, so it could be preferably something that you've um, uh, that you've discarded. <coughs> Don't worry. I'll tell you what to do with it in a minute. Right, so, um, so that's that. 
make sure your entrance is small uh, because if you have a big entrance, the chances are the bees won't um, won't go in it. <clears throat> um, for some reason, they, <laughs> I don't like humanizing bees, as probably most of you know, but um, uh, it's almost as if they think they can't defend it. <clears throat> also, the same with open mesh floors. I very rarely had a, uh, a swarm go in a, in a hive with open mesh floor. And if you've got a, a crown board, don't take the trouble to scrape the, uh, any combs off it, just leave it. So all that lot's there. If it's at home, I just use one comb. And the reason I use one comb is that because I'm home uh, more or less every day, I, I go and have a look at the bees. If I see there's a swarm taken up residence, what I can do is I can shake the bees off that comb, put them all onto foundation, don't feed them, so that if a colony has come from, uh, or the swarm has come from a colony with the EFB, or, or any, any foul brew really, yeah, um, yeah, foul brew rather than just EFB, um, it will, um, uh, it, it should get, get, get rid of that. And of course, it will come with, with the honey. If the bees store the, uh, the, the, the nectar or the honey in that comb, or any combs you've got in there, of course, it keeps the, um, uh, keeps the disease going. Right. Uh, at that point, I'll then burn that comb. So, uh, uh, so that's why I only put one comb and why you can use your old combs. So that's that. Swarming now. Do you actually know the process? Um, intermediate and advanced should, but as I've said on other occasions, um, it's surprising the number of beekeepers who were, uh, who, who don't know what's actually happening inside the uh, colony. You really must learn it before you can control it. But I'm, I think I'm on fairly safe grounds here. Um, but this is one case where I wasn't because I was invited to give a, um, a demonstration at uh, a beekeeping association and it was a beekeeper's uh, house. So, okay, we all went along there, about 30 people or whatever. And... Um, uh, the um, beekeeper announced that uh, there's no point looking at the colonies uh, because I've got them all on double brew chambers um, uh, to stop some swarming so I don't have to look at my bees. And there were about 10 or a dozen colonies all on a line. Um, so uh, the sort of questions started getting asked. So what's the point of um, having a demonstrator? We've got nothing to demonstrate, which was a reasonable question, I thought. Uh, anyway, um, the owner sort of re fairly reluctantly um, said, yeah, okay. Um, so the very first colony I came to, look at what was looking at me. And look what was on the bottom end. Here are all the queen cells that had, uh, that had emerged. And they, this was a top brood chamber. Um, so don't think that you, you're going to um, uh, prevent swarming by putting bees on double brood chamber. Get yourself a good, sound, sensible swarm control method uh, if you can. Prevention and control at the end is part of my overall management system. Uh, it's not something I think of um, uh, as soon as I see queen cells in front of me uh, and panic like, uh, like a lot of beekeepers do. What about you folk? Have you got something lined up? I hope so. Now go and get yourself prepared because... Uh, uh, you've probably heard enough of me anyway. So thanks very much for listening. That's it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Roger. Do you want me to uh, come out, out, out of this then? As per usual, there's uh, there's tons and tons of questions. No, there aren't. You made them all up. Uh, ranging <laughs> lots of questions about combs, which is good. Uh, <clears throat> a question about uh, importing bees following Brexit. Um, first question then, I used oxalic acid on my hives during the winter and had a full super of honey underneath the brood box. Is it all right to use the same super uh, and frames and place it back on top of the brood box in spring after treating with Ooh. oxalic? Right. This putting um, uh, a super of honey underneath the brood is a new thing. Um, never used to do it. 
I've never done it, and quite frankly, I just cannot see the uh, the, the reasons or benefits for it, um, because bees expect honey um, food to be above them, not below. Right. Having said that, um, I'm not sure that I'm in a position to uh, answer this, um, or not to advise anyway, um, because we're using um, a sort of external substance. And I think I could be putting myself in a position that I'd rather not want, if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. Uh, you know, if you, if you ask it, I'm online, you see. Um, say again, sorry. I'm online. You are online. You know, so, so um, you know, somebody can listen in, in, in later, yeah. So, so to the questioner, sorry about that. <laughs> um, your views about feeding pollen substitute or supplement in early spring <clears throat> i never have uh i've no need to in my area and i've no most of the places i go is no no need to um anyway because there's no pollen shortage there's only ever one place that i came across and every colony was short of pollen um if you're Feeding pollen substitutes, I guess what you're trying to do is, is to encourage a colony to build up. If you're doing that, then you're expecting it to um, overstretch itself. <clears throat> I think then you've got a couple of issues. One is if you get some, uh, if you get um, uh, really cold weather, if the bees contract, uh, you can possibly have a uh, chill brood. The other one is, if you're pushing the bees so hard, what you end up with is a lot less nurse bees looking after the brood. That may get underfed. If it's underfed, it's then opening it right up for um, uh, diseases. Uh, certainly, um, a chalk brood, uh, because chalk brood is um, usually bat, bat worse in the spring um, for that reason and um, possibly EFB as well, because um, uh, they both seem to thrive on poor nutrition. I don't like doing it. Uh, I don't like the idea of doing it. I've, I, 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 I've never done it. Um, well, uh, well, well let, let, let me just go back. <clears throat> I've come across people that have done it and they built their colonies up and then they're because they, they swarm three weeks later. You know, if you're not careful, you're building them up too quick mm. for them to swarm, and they're, and they're not doing something about the swarm. Yeah, sorry, Richard. Uh, no, um, the next question was, um, uh, in the news, obviously, there's been uh, a story about uh, bees being imported following Brexit. Has there? Uh, apparently so, yeah. Apparently I didn't so. know anything about this. Um, and um, we've had a question of uh, what your opinion is of that. From what point of view? Uh, what's your opinion on government ban on import of live bees following Brexit? Well, it, it's the same with other things as uh, as well, isn't it? Um, that's that's the law, and um, uh, you 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 really ought to comply with it. If you're not, you're breaking the law. Um, it it seems pretty cut and dry to me, and to try and find a way around it in We've got to be careful what I say here, but but in other circumstances, a person that's doing it um, might not think too uh, too highly of it. Hmm. Um, next question was. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let me carry on if if, if you like. Um, I think there's another issue about um, in, imported bees, but that wasn't part of the question um, because personally, I think we can do without we, we can do without the imports. I don't think we need them. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Um, have you ever experimented with double nuke colonies? So I clarified with the person who asked this question, and he was talking about brood chambers where they had a division board in the middle. Yep. Um, have you ever experimented with those for your um, resource colonies? <laughs> for your and units? Um, yes, I have. Um, but I, I did it mainly for uh, raising nukes and um, uh, raising queens. <clears throat> And it sounds a great idea, um, but I found them a nuisance. And I'll tell you what, why. 
Um, it sounds great. Just you know, get 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 a brew chamber, put a put a, div um, uh, a division in, and it's um, holding each corner sort of thing, and away you go. Um, and I ran them for three or four years, I suppose, and I found them a nuisance. And a couple of reasons why. If perhaps you want, if you've got two nukes in, if you want to move one, you've got to take it out or move both. That's one thing. Um, and the other thing is, if you want to take one out, um, it's not very easy shaking, shaking the bees out when you've got a colony in the other side. And <clears throat> what I did was, I um, after about three years, I suppose I had about 10 or a dozen of them. Um, what I did was I, um, I, I abandoned the idea. Um, in, the, in the States, they call them queen castles. Um, and I'll send them out there with anything um, up to about three, three boxes. And um, they seem to have exactly the same problems that I did. Um, theirs were even worse because they were, I think, on three frames on each one. And of course... A three frame nuke really isn't very big. Uh, two five frame nukes, um, you you can do something with it. You can take a frame and brood away or something like that. With a with a three frame, it's much more difficult. Hmm. Uh, we've had several questions about uh, comb. Um, any advice on getting supers of foundation drawn? Um, was one that I thought might be a useful answer. Yeah, to. I think think. Yeah, <laughs> we get back to what I said. If you, if if the the bees will only uh, draw comb if they've got the income with which to produce the wax to build it. So, um, if you are going to put a super of uh, a foundation on, have a look at the weather forecast a week in advance. Um, if it's going to be tipping down with rain, um, you're wasting your time. Um, not only you're wasting your time, but the bees may climb up over it. And um, uh, uh, and make it it goes sort of shiny, doesn't it? And then the, then they they don't build on it very, very well. Uh, what I tend to do is either put it the first super on, or get a super of, if get a really strong colony, put a a, a, um, uh, a super of drawn comb on, get that sort of half filled, third filled, half filled. And then put the, the uh, foundation underneath it, and you find they just go, uh, they go um, a, a balmy. I've had uh, a super of foundation drawn out and sealed in a week. Hmm. Not very often, but you know that's if you get conditions right, they the, they will the, 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 they will do it. Hmm. Um, uh, well, well, sorry, sorry, going sideways. Um, uh, that's for a full box. I suggest very strongly that you don't do what some people think is a good idea. Uh, stagger a comb and a, a foundation, comb, foundation, comb, foundation. Because what often happens is that the bees find it a lot easier to continue drawing the comb than they do work on the foundation. So what you very often get is the, is the, um, is the comb drawn wider and the foundation uh, left that they do that regularly. Mm. If you're going to play around like that, then put the all the foundation one side. And the, the worst you do is mess mess up one comb. <clears throat> super. Um, the next one is uh, when you say add a super early. When do you mean early March? Can it be uh, too early? Well, 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 well. <laughs> right. This is one of the problems with getting advice. Because if that person came from Norfolk, let's say, it would be three, four weeks out, perhaps from up in the Welsh Hills. So what you've got to do, I think, is is um, is go on on conditions rather than time. You can also get uh, some years at three or four weeks different th than others quite easily. And uh, yeah, so it's very. This is this is one of my objections to um, the uh, the beginners' pages in the magazines um, because they're, they're they're probably writing from their point of view, uh, which uh, doesn't suit many many other people. So I'd rather not go on time. It's what the conditions are, the state of the, um, the state of the colony itself, the um, 
uh, the forage, all sorts of things like that. Um, then we had a, a question about uh, mouldy pollen combs and whether or not uh, you can just pop them straight back in the colony for them to, to clean up. No, they won't do it. Um, what they'll probably do is propolize them um, and then you've got just, just a big lump. Probably the easy way of doing it is don't, don't, don't throw your combs away, whatever you do. Just get the hook end of, oh, I haven't got a hive tool here, hook, hook end of um, the uh, claw type hive tool the one with the nail puller in, and just pull that through the comb, and you can pull out this pollen in great big lumps, and you, you can get right back down to the foundation. Now, when I said earlier that if you've got damaged combs, put them on shallow, um, narrow, um, narrow spacing, you can do that with a good comb either side of it, and the, 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 they'll pull them up, and they'll make a, make a good job. Don't, don't chuck them away, whatever you do. Now, sometimes with pollen, um, it goes really hard and you can actually pull it out nice nice and easy. Other times it goes a bit sort of gooey and I don't know the reason for that, but you can certainly hook it out anyway. The bees will, bees will make a good job building it up. Um, there's still questions coming in, but um, the, this one is, what's the difference between temper compared to calm? I think that was when you were talking about your record cards. Ah, right, yeah, okay, yeah. <clears throat> temper is a temper of the bees, whether they're um, uh, gentle or uh, a bit spiky. Uh, you can work whichever end you like. Some, some people um, uh, sort of go up the scale, uh, they go up, up the scale as a um, as they improve or, 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 or down the scale. Incidentally, uh, we used to have a, <laughs> a member at um, uh, Whisper Green and um, how he measured temper was that he'd give every colony 10 and he'd knock one off for every sting he got, now, whether it was accidental or not. And uh, 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 it, it worked, well, I think it worked for him, but it, it's, it's, it's obviously not a... Uh, not a particularly good uh, good way of doing. Calm them is calmness on the comb. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. And the reason I like calm bees is um, uh, because if the bees rush around, the queens always do. And on occasions I've seen them outside the hive, I've even seen them inside feeders, um, and they're very difficult to very difficult to find. When I say calm, I don't mean these soft yellow things that just sit there and go. Oh, Sorry, I've got the top on, but <laughs> you you got a couple of yellow ones behind you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I I don't mean those because uh, you know they're, they're not much use to anyone. Um, I mean I mean proper bees. Hmm. But you you can see just have a look at them, and you can see whether they've got any purpose or what they're doing, or whether there's any sort of vibrancy to the to the colony or not. Um, and then the, the final question then, um, why do you use thin foundation rather than a starter strip for cut comb honey? Oh, you can do. <clears throat> right. Yeah. But what, whatever you do, I suggest that you, um, you try and do it all the same. Because um, I don't think we understand that in a natural situation, drawing comb, bees are clustering underneath and they're drawing the comb down. When you put foundation in, they're clustering and they, they're, they're working on the side, which isn't very good for them. And I think what would happen is that if you put one foundation, one uh, starter strip, which would be a logical thing to do, because then you get, should get straight combs, or you think you get straight combs. I think what the bees will do is they'll work on the starter strips, pulling them down, and they'll make wider combs and, and they might even ignore the, um, ignore the foundation. So I suggest that if you do it, you, you have all the same, um, the same type. So if you've got starter strips, do all starter strip, all starter strips, all thin foundation, um, all, um, uh, all thin foundation. Excellent. We're going to have to leave it there, Roger. It's uh, five to seven. Quite, um, is it? <laughs> yes. Oh, Whittacombe will be on soon. And I'll have a dinner. Yeah, OK. So, uh, thank you very much, Roger. And thank you to all our participants, um, over 400 uh, participants. So that's really good. Thank you very much. OK. And thank you. And good night, everybody. And we'll see you in half an hour, isn't it?
Yes. Joe Whittacombe, yeah. Okay. Bye now.